Um, and yes, we had a little bit of a few comments in chat. Um, we will be displaying the videos and we will send those out um, to all of the people that attended today. Um, so all of the presentations will have um, PowerPoints and also um, the, the actual videos that have been recorded live. Um, so those will probably be available later this week, maybe early next week. Um, it takes a little bit of time to, to edit everything down and, and send it out. So um, anyway, keep on sending your questions over to us. Um, our board members are here today and can hopefully get back to you um, with, uh, with some information if you need it. Um, and like Scott discussed in his last presentation, um, if you don't have our new model rental agreement that was updated earlier this year, um, with the items that Scott discussed, um, we are happy to provide that to you. So um, it's one of the biggest benefits of being a member with us is that we try to keep up with that for everyone and we hope that you will take advantage of it. Okay, with that, um, I'll go ahead and try to get Ben's, um, Ben's presentation started. So, stop and then share my screen. Okay. Hey, Steve, can um, you see the presentation that's playing right now with, with Ben? I see it, yes. Perfect. Okay. And let me know if the audio is working also. The audio is not working. Okay. Okay, having a little bit of technical difficulty, we'll get this back up in just a minute. Okay, what about now? I see your video. I don't see the video, no. Okay, I, I see this. You do have the screen showing now. Okay, so um, I'm gonna hit play and then let me know if that um, audio is working. Okay. Okay. Can yeah, you hear I still that? Know, no, can't hear the audio. Hey, Shelly, do you want me to go live? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> we went fine during right. testing yesterday, but yeah, go ahead. Steve, can you pass the screen over to Ben? You should be able to claim it. 
you should be able to claim that. Um, yeah, I hear. Can you hear me, Shelley? Yeah, I can. Okay, I can't hear you, but I hear me. Uh, I, let's see. You can hear me, Ben, right? Okay, can can you hear me still, Shelley? Yes, you are good. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you guys for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to share again uh, with the association. Um, what I'm basically gonna talk to you about today is the importance of having a solid operations manual, uh, putting this together to make operations at your facility run as smoothly as possible. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Once again, my name is Ben Evans. I'm with Janus International. Um, a little bit about Janus. We are the number one supplier in the world of roll-up doors and hallway systems. Uh, we have multiple product types and, and services that we offer. Of course, we do uh, new construction. We also have a program called R3, which stands for Restore, Rebuild, Replace. Uh, that involves door changeouts on an existing facilities, reconfiguring your property uh, to maximize your unit mix for the current demand. Uh, we're also pioneers in smart entry access controls. I've, you've heard talks earlier today, uh, references to Bluetooth locking systems that can help automate your facility. We also offer portable storage units um, that you can add onto your property uh, where you couldn't otherwise build a permanent structure. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I had no idea that you can make a career in the self-storage industry, but that's somehow what I've managed to do over the last 13 years. Uh, I got started in the industry with a commercial mortgage broker right out of college. So I was financing all kinds of income producing properties around the country, but we had a real specialty in the self-storage product. Uh, during that time, that company purchased a self-storage facility in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm based in East Texas, so I ran a facility across the border. Um, I had a unique opportunity to learn the business from the top side down from uh, taking and organizing financial statements and uh, coordinating loan packages and taking that knowledge of uh, the end result of operating a profitable facility and taking that into the day-to-day -day operations. Um, I'm getting a pop-up here. Um, uh, during that time running that facility, I took it through a major expansion and renovation product or project. We actually had the first multi-story uh, self-storage facility in Shreveport. Um, got that through lease up, we liquidated, sold it out, and then when I I went to work for a top 20 property management company uh, prior to joining Janus. Um, I've also served on the board of directors for, for the Louisiana Self Storage Association for the past five years or so. So we're going to talk about the operations manual, the what, what is an operations manual, why do you need one, and how do you make it? Well, put simply, uh, my friend Megan Smith at selfstoragecpa.com says that a well-written self-storage operations manual is a living roadmap for running your business. Well, the idea of a roadmap, uh, it gives you a, a path to follow to get to your end result. So the first thing you need to know is what is your, your end road? Maybe your roadmap looks something like this. You purchase your first facility, you increase your occupancy and your rental rates. By doing that, you become profitable. Maybe from there, you wanna leverage those profits and expand operations into multiple facilities. And when the time is right, maybe you wanna liquidate um, and you can repeat that entire process. Or maybe you're like me and one day you want to retire to a life of luxury. So know your end goal uh, to develop that roadmap. Why do you need one? Well. I like to look at the flip side of things sometimes. Uh, so before we jump into why you need one, why would you not need one? 
Well, if you uh, if you like IRS audits, you probably don't need an operations manual. If you enjoy a chaotic workspace and constant calls from your managers on how to complete daily tasks, uh, the, an operations manual is probably not for you. If you think to wing it and pretend it's a plan is a plan, and you're ultimately throwing money down the drain, I don't like to waste time and money. So uh, if, if a task is not necessary, I don't want to do it. So by going through this process, you can uh, streamline your operations and know where maybe there's waste in time and resources. Um, if you like being sued and distributing large payouts for wrongful termination, wrongful sale, uh, or denial of entry, um, or even secession of ownership, uh, this is not for you. Guys, I actually, as a manager of that facility in Shreveport, got sued at one point in time um, because of our procedures regarding secession of ownership. The gentleman passed away whose name was on the lease. Um, his current wife was paying for that unit, and um, I received a judgment of secession from a local judge that stated the contents of the unit belonged to the gentleman's daughter from a previous marriage. So I ended up locking out the lady who is currently paying the bill, the current wife, so that made her mad. Uh, but what, I mean, what was I going to do? I got a letter from a judge that says the contents belong to someone else. So she ultimately took us to court. Uh, thankfully, the judge w um, had good sense, looked at the lease and said, your name is not on the lease and threw it out in less than 90 seconds. Uh, but it's it's good to have procedures in place before those kinds of things happen so you can deal with them when they come. Uh, and if you enjoy HR issues, you probably don't need one, an operations manual. And lastly, if you're in favor of corporate espionage and you don't mind your manager giving away criti critical information about your occupancy and rent roll, uh, maybe an operations manual is not for you, but I think everyone out there it's much smarter than that. We all want to avoid problems and, and minimize those situations. Uh, last, lastly, if you're so cynical, ruthless, and cold-hearted that cute babies and puppies don't make you smile, then you probably don't need an operations manual. And generally in person, I would expect to see a lot of smiles out there because these are my babies here. Uh, so let's get serious. Why do I need an operations manual? Well, step one, uh, the reason one, you need to standardize your procedures. If, if you have multiple properties or if you want to have multiple properties, uh, it's going to be critical so you can easily substitute your managers in the office. Um, you know, if you have standardized procedures across all of your properties, then you should be able to move a manager from any facility. They can walk in the doors of that office for the first time and be able to fully operate that facility without question of, of where to find what they need and, and how to do what they need to do, which ultimately this is going to create a lot of efficiency in your operations. Um, again, legal protection. Make sure that you're following legal procedures. Make sure that your employee agreements, the terms of their employment are clearly specified. Um, this comes in this becomes key when you're dealing with terminations, wrongful termination lawsuits. Uh, you have, in order to create accountability, you have to be able to set expectations um, in order to evaluate. So lay those expectations out there clearly to protect yourself from legal consequence. So let me ask this question. Why are you in business? I mean, did you get into the storage business because you felt bad for everyone who's going through life-changing situations. Uh, I know that's sad, but I, I mean, were, were you really sitting at home one day thinking about Tom, your next door neighbor? You know, Tom's been a good neighbor. He feeds your dog when you're on vacation. Uh, he lets you know when there's trouble around the neighborhood. And well, Tom fell on tough times. He lost his job. He's gonna have to downsize his home uh, and he's gonna need affordable storage. So um, maybe you went out and you spent $2 million on a storage facility just to give um, a great deal. No, nobody ever did that. There's one reason you get into business. Of course, we help people along the way, but we're in business to make money, as my good friend, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank says. So since you're in business to make money, it's important to know 
what kind of business you're in and how each kind of business makes money. Uh, this is what's called the cash flow quadrant. It was created by a gentleman named Robert Kiyosaki, who is kind of a financial guru on personal finance business, real estate finance. Um, he's written a couple of books that I always recommend to people. The first one is called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The second one is called the cash flow quadrant. This concept is the cash flow quadrant from that book and goes into greater detail. Uh, but in a nutshell, there's four ways to make money. On the left-hand side of this quadrant, that's all active income. You're either an employee where you trade your time for money, you have a job. You're self-employed where you own a job. And in either of those scenarios, if you don't work, you don't get paid. Um, so our goal is to move across to the, the ongoing or passive income side. Uh, there's two ways to do that. Number one is as a business owner where you own a business system and people work for you and you profit off of their work or you do it through investments. Um, now, most of you, I would imagine, uh, who are joining in as owners, you're business owners. Um, and so you develop a business system. Well, that begs the question, what is a business system? Well, a, a great example of a business system is McDonald's. It's probably the most popular one because it's one everyone is familiar with. Uh, so I always ask people, is, McDonald, is McDonald's profitable because they make a good hamburger. I mean, how many of you out there can make a better burger than McDonald's? And I'm, I'm sure everyone is raising their hand right now. So, so they're obviously, they don't have the best food in the world, but they're profitable because they have a great system. You can walk into any McDonald's virtually anywhere in the world. I believe my wife went to a McDonald's in Hong Kong and she was able to get an American cheeseburger. Um, so their system is what allows them to be profitable. They even have an education system called Hamburger University in Chicago where they send their managers to learn how to effectively operate a McDonald's restaurant. So uh, as bottom line is, a system is something that's easily duplicatable across any business platform. So how do you make one? The first step in making uh, an operations manual, if you're the owner, you have to engage your store manager. Uh, store managers, engage your owner in the process. Talk to each other. Ask lots of questions. Document the daily tasks. Be very detailed. You can't be too detailed in making an operations manual. Um, and if you're like me, uh, to, to focus and get things done, maybe you need a little bit of caffeine. Now, this is an ongoing process. Wash, rinse, repeat, try, fail, adjust. Uh, this is a living roadmap. And because it's living, we have to constantly reevaluate uh, what works and what doesn't based on the current market situations. Um, you know, I don't remember much, to be honest with you, about my college education and business school. Uh, but there was one case study that stuck out to me in our capstone course that said that most businesses fail because they simply fail to reevaluate their business strategy and make adjustments. So don't be that operator that fails to make adjustments and watch your business fail as a, re a result of that. Um, so going back to McDonald's, streamline the process. There's a, a movie called The Founder um, where I love this scene in the movie where they were very detailed and very meticulous uh, you know, their goal was to serve the most number of burgers they could in a given day. The average drive-in was taking 10 to 15 minutes to put out an order, or they were putting out orders in like two to five minutes. So they, they streamlined the process. And in this scene in the movie, they actually went out to a tennis court and they sketched out the exact dimensions of their kitchen and each station in chalk on the tennis court, uh, the two brothers, one of them climbed up on a ladder, and they had their employees physically walk through their daily tasks to, to make and serve a hamburger uh, and soft drinks and the whole process. And in the early parts of it, uh, people were turning around with trays, they were bumping into each other, and so that, they scrapped that idea and they could rearrange things. And, and they continued to tweak and streamline until they reached a maximum efficiency. So that's what we want to do in creating our operations manual. So things to include uh, in great detail, your daily procedures. Um, and when I say in great detail, I know people out there, professionals who operate management companies, 
the first thing in their operations manual on their daily task list is turn on the light. When you come in the office, turn on the light. And, and while that may seem a little bit patronizing, the reality is we've all been in a situation where you show up five minutes before you're supposed to open the office and there's already a line of five people out front waiting to, to make a rental and or to make payments. And it's so easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle. You want to take care of these uh, customers quickly. Uh, so you get back behind the computer, you're starting to process payments. You look up, why is it so dark in here? Oh, I forgot to turn, off the, uh, turn on the light. That's happened to me. So it's not patronizing to include that level of detail. Uh, it's just a checklist, uh, you know, to not get caught up in, in the hustle and bustle. We don't want to overlook any critical details. So, so document everything in detail from the time you open, from the time you walk into the door. Um, things like what software needs to be running on your computer. Are you operating SiteLink or, or storage or easy storage? Uh, what's your operations um, pro property management software? Um, are you using PTI? Are you using uh, Noki for your access control? Um, are you using Outlook or Gmail for your email service? Um, have a list of all of those items that need to be open so you can um, operate business throughout the day. What is the process for taking payments? Now, one of the things that I did when it came to these procedures that deal with um, your property management software, I used SiteLink at the time. I love SiteLink, it's a great program. Um, one of their downsides is uh, it, it's user friendly, yes, but they didn't have a lot of detailed instructions on how to use it. So I took screenshots of the payment screens and I made detailed bullet points of how to take payments how to process a move in or a move out. Uh, when you're dealing with auto pay, yes, of course, it's easiest to set it up at the time of move in, but what about when that customer's card expires and it needs to be updated? Where do you go within the software platform to make that update? Do you, do you require another signature or an e-signature uh, to make that change and transition? Um, how do you conduct your daily walkthrough, your, your cleaning of the facility? Do you have checklists for those tasks to make sure everything gets documented? Um, when you're running your daily clothes, uh, dealing with counting your, your cash receipts, your checks, your credit cards, making sure everything balances. Um, every detail of these procedures should be documented in your operations manual. How about phone etiquette? Uh, do you have a script for your sales procedure and your collection calls? Um, make sure that, that it's clearly outlined. One of the things that we did at my facility uh, we had a script printed out for each of these items, um, and there were blanks where we were supposed to get information from the customer. When someone would call in a prospective customer, uh, their name, their phone number, so we could call them back if we get disconnected, or we could call them back to follow up on that phone call. So what we did, we had, had that printed out, and we would slip it in a little a binder sheet, one of those clear paper protectors. And we would fill it out with a dry erase marker. We'd enter it into the software after the fact. And then we would erase it and start all over. Uh, so just little tricks like that, that can be very effective. It's simple. Uh, it's pretty low tech, but it's highly effective when you implement it. Um, your lean procedures, do you have uh, all of that laid out clearly? Um, your, your auction provider, your on, if you're doing online auctions, who is your preferred auction provider? What's the process for setting up an auction? Um, do you have procedures in place for death and secession of a tenant? I laid out a story earlier um, about the scenario where I, I was sued by a customer uh, for denial of entry during a secession. I had no idea. That, that was not at the front of my mind when I took over the operations at that facility. Uh, but it came up. And you know what? It wasn't the first time I had a tenant pass away. It's an unfortunate reality that if you have not experienced it, you will and you will experience it multiple times. So uh, have those procedures laid out to protect yourself, to protect your manager, uh, so they know what information to ask for when somebody passes away in order to transfer ownership of that unit. Uh, your procedures for rate management. Um, how often do you review your street rates, your standard rates? Whose responsibility is it to review those rates? Are you using push rates at your facility? And what are the procedures for using that? 
How often do you do rate increases on your existing tenants? Uh, Scott talk, talked about that earlier in today's environment. Be very careful about that. Under normal circumstances, you know, we would do annual rate increases. And I'll talk a little bit about that because every time I mention uh, rate increases on existing customers, it seems like a lot of air gets sucked out of the room. People are, uh, this, this is one of the biggest areas where people leave money, operators leave money on the table just because of a fear of raising rates on existing tenants. So I'm gonna deviate just a moment and, and talk about this topic. Uh, how critical it is to know your market. Now more than ever, know your market, know what's happening at the facilities around you. Um, you, you don't, especially in economic hardships and times like we're experiencing with COVID, uh, you don't want to do anything that creates bad optics for your facility and bad word of mouth because that's very hard to overcome. So know what's going on around you and how you can differentiate yourself, but also remain competitive, especially as far as your rates go. Uh, the big question that people usually ask in regards to uh, increasing rates on existing tenants is, well, won't they all move out? Well, according to national operators, um, let generally, less than 2% at most will move out. Uh, my, my personal experience is less than half of a percent move out with, with an increase. Um, but there are studies out there that show that having any rate increase at all is, can cause people to move out regardless of the amount of the increase. But the bottom line is when effectively implementing rent increases on existing tenants, the bottom line is you will make more money with less people in your facility. Um, you know, I, I like to ask people, is it a good idea to be 100% occupied? Um, the quick answer to that is no. Going back to McDonald's, if you are out of hamburgers, you're out of business. Well, if you're out of storage units, you have no product to sell. So we, we don't want to be 100% occupied. That is not an optimal state of operation. So when it comes to increasing rates on existing tenants, your increases should be consistent and fair. You have no special customers. Uh, you can't pick and choose who gets increases. Um, and, and that comes into play, I know, a lot of times for managers. Uh, managers are on the front lines. They've got the relationships with the tenants. Um, you know, Ms. Drew, she would come in. She got us baby gifts when our kids were born. Uh, people, people would do very nice things and take care of your managers when you have a good manager. And so it can be emotionally hard sometimes for a manager to raise rates on that, that um, customer. But the reality is we have to remove favoritism. Uh, you may give consideration to tenants with multiple units. Maybe you're out of 10 by 20s and you rent a two 10 by 10s for a 10 by 20 rate. Then make sure that the increases are commensurate with that person running a 10 by 20. But ultimately remove for, uh, personality and favoritism from the process. So when you're doing your rate increases, uh, once again, survey the competition. Um, it, under normal circumstances, I would increase the tenant rates annually, uh, not on recently moved in tenants. At, at my facility, we would do the first rental rate increase after nine months and then, or excuse me, after 12 months, and then they would get a rate increase every nine months after that. So it was about one increase per year. Uh, use a percentage approach, maybe 5% across the board as opposed to $5, because $5 for a $100 unit is only a 5% increase, but it's 20% on, um, on a $25 a unit. So make sure that it's fair, just a percentage across the board. Uh, make sure they're modest and regular as opposed to large and in irregular increases. You know. Uh, customers need to know what to expect. And for regular modest increases, uh, you set the expectations, you're gonna have a lot less grief from your, your customers. And then ultimately collect the rent. Don't leave the, that extra rent uncollected. Uh, people who are sending in checks automatically from their bank, they may fail to log into their bank and update the amount of that check on a monthly basis. Call them up, say, hey, Ms. Drew, I, I know you're on auto pay. Um, we did have that rate increase. It looks like your check came in a little short this month. I just want to remind you there is a balance due, and please make that update for next month. 
you have to make those calls. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program on, on what to include in your operations manual. Uh, I like to have checklists um, from, in addition to the daily tasks, what about monthly events? Uh, how often do you do your inventory? Who's, whose responsibility is it to take inventory? Where do you buy your, uh, your inventory from? Who is updating your prices? Because uh, we know that prices go up as a business owner, your cost of goods sold will go up. Well, we need to make sure that you're increasing your resale price commensurately to maintain your margins. Uh, what about your maintenance schedules? How often um, do you sweep and mop the hallways as well as individual units? How often do you grease the springs on your doors? Now, the answer if you have a Janus door is never, but if you have other doors, those have to be maintained on a regular basis. Uh, what about your landscaping? Who's responsible for taking care of that? Is it on a weekly or bi weekly basis? Is it on an as needed basis? If it's as needed, who has to make that call to get them on the property? Um, your HVAC, making sure that your filters are changed, uh, that the drainage is flowing properly. Your pest control, do you handle that in-house uh, or is it outsourced? And making sure that that is done when it's supposed to be done. Preferred vendors, um, when it comes to your bank, you know we have deposit slips, your check stamp for endorsing, Whose responsibility is it to keep up with those items and reorder them as needed? Uh, your HVAC, your plumber and electrician, door and gate repair. Have a list of these preferred vendors. And when it comes to these trades, I highly recommend having a depth chart. Uh, you know, having at least two, but preferably three vendors in order of preference. Uh, because it, it's inevitable if you have a, a door, again, once again, not a Janus door, when that spring breaks, um, it's not going to happen on a vacant unit at nine o'clock in the morning for your manager. It's going to happen for that occupied unit who comes in at 530 to get something after work when your manager is getting ready to leave it at six o'clock. And now suddenly you have to make an after hours call to a vendor to get that door repaired so your customer's property can be uh, protected overnight. So it may take two or three phone calls to get somebody who has availability to come out at a given time. And, and those are critical items that need to be handled fairly immediately. Uh, your print and marketing materials, um, who handles, who's your vendor for those and whose responsible is it, whose responsibility is it to reorder those when needed. Uh, how about corporate information? Uh, if you have critical contacts at your corporate office, those need to be clearly identified and easy to access. Um, any corporate forms like employee notification forms, time off request forms, um, things of that nature, uh, as well as your, your lease information, your customer forms. Um, W-9s at the end of every year, uh, your managers get a lot of notifications and requests from, from commercial customers who need a W-9. Well, guess what? That's that's not a sensitive document. Leave it saved in a folder or somewhere on the desktop of the computer so your manager can just fire that over in an email and it saves a lot of headaches. Um, have a secure place to store access codes uh, and appropriate passwords for your manager so they can quickly access it if there's an emergency or, or you know, we all have brain farts or cognitive flatulations from time to time, as I've heard it said. Uh, we need reminders sometimes. slide. Um, employee expectations. Uh, what do you expect from your employee, employees in terms of code of conduct, your dress code, uh, employee benefits, holidays, vacation, and payroll procedures? Um, you know, you can reduce a lot of questions to your, to your home office just by having this laid out in an easy to access booklet in your operations manual. Have it tabbed out of the section where your employees can find all the information they need to know. Uh, once again, when it comes to, to terminations and evaluating your employees, uh, you have to have these, these expectations laid out and they need to be in an accessible place for your employees at all times. Uh, how do you handle property expenses when you get invoices, credit card receipts, petty cash receipts? Um, do you have a filing system at your facility? 
Are you keeping paper files? Do those receipts need to be mailed to an accountant or emailed? Are you doing strictly digital files? When it comes to your filing systems, uh, it's critical, especially when you have multiple facilities, your filing system needs to be exactly the same at every property, whether it's paper files or electronic files. Uh, once again, your employees need to be able to walk, and frankly, you as an owner and operator, need to be able to walk into any facility at any given time and, and pull a folder out of the, the drawer or pull open a document on the desktop of the computer and, and get critical information answered and, and resolved. But clearly have that laid out. When those items come into the manager at the office, what are they supposed to do with them? Uh, also include hours of operations for your office and your gate. Uh, and your after hours contact. When it comes to hours of operations and having multiple facilities, there, there's two schools of thought out there. Uh, number one is to just standardize your hours across the board, and, and that's fine in some cases. I, I tend to look at each facility, at each property, as being its own animal and what works for each location. So have uh, all of your operation hours from each of your facilities in your operations manual at every site. This is especially important if you have uh, a relief manager, assistant manager, or any manager who moves from property to property. If they're going to be at one property on Tuesday and a different one on Wednesday, they can open that operations manual and see exactly what time they need to be there uh, at that specific facility. Um, after hours contact, if there's an emergency, uh, police are contacted, who, who do they call if someone comes in for a fire inspection and they need to know who that contact is, uh, your employees can just hand that out and that's, that's fine. And uh, we discussed the filing system already, so we'll move on to the, the next phase. Um, emergency procedures. Who thought 12 months ago that we were dealing with pandemic preparation or now pandemic remediation. We're trying to move past it and operate in a, in a world uh, where we are in a health pandemic. Um, make sure that you have procedures in place to make sure that your employees feel safe as well as your customers. If there's no co consumer confidence in how you're operating, then you're not gonna have consumers. Um, again, employee safety, make sure they feel safe, not just in the time of a pandemic, but for general security purposes, um, how do you handle a robbery, for instance? What are the procedures? What is the employee supposed to do if someone comes in and makes a threat uh, in order to rob the facility? Make sure that they feel safe and protected at all costs. Um, dealing with property break-ins, who files the police reports and notifies the tenants? Um, if you're dealing with a natural disaster from flood, wind, or fire, or, or otherwise rain and storms, who deals with those situations? What's the, the policy to do so? Um, God forbid you ever have to deal with the media in, a in the midst of a disaster, but who is the media contact? Um, I would make sure that it is you as the owner and not your managers. And then as, as the owner, uh, have a plan in place. If you are contacted by the media, do you plan to do a physical verbal interview or do you want to just provide a written statement? so your words don't get twisted around. Have those plans in place before you need them, um, because hopefully it will never happen, but you need to be prepared in the event that it does. Lastly, as owners and operators, um, for your spouse or for your business partner, um, in a worst case scenario, if something happens to you and you pass away, Will the survivor know how to carry on the business? Do you have an, a plan in place for this event? Um, can they access all the records of the business, your bank and your mortgage info, uh, insurance, not just for the facility, but life insurance policies that you may hold, uh, passwords, do you have a will and secession in place? And make sure that it's clearly cut to the best of your ability. Um, a, a friend of ours, uh, the Janus family and a personal friend passed away. He owns a number of facilities in Shreveport. Uh, suddenly passed away last year in a plane crash. And it was a number of months before their properties could even write a check to pay their bills because his, um, 
his secession was tied up in, in legal issues. And he thought that he had a good plan in place, but it became kind of a, a nightmare for his family and partners. So make sure you have all those plans in place to the best of your ability. Um, I know I went through this pretty fast, but I want to throw some additional resources out there. I mentioned Megan Smith at selfstoragecpa.com earlier. Um, Bob Copper, who you heard from earlier today, he has information on his website about operations manuals. Um, Inside Self Storage has some products that you can purchase as well. Uh, but I, I do encourage you, if you do purchase a, a product from Bob, Megan, or Inside Self Storage, uh, it is simply a template. It's foundational. You still need to go through these individual steps to customize your operations manual for your facility. Lastly, um, I encourage you to give, give me a call anytime, not just for any, anything related to Janus for the doors and hallways or smart entry system. But again, I'm, I'm a storage professional. I love the storage industry and I'm happy to talk all things storage. So feel free to reach out to me anytime uh, through phone, text, or email, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you soon. And Shelly, with that, I'll pass the reins back over to you. Great. Thank you, Ben. That was an awesome um, presentation. We really appreciate it. And um, we will pretty much wrap things up. Um, Charles, would you like to, to say any closing words before?